Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's um, edition of CMO Peer Talks. I'm very excited to welcome you today because we have an amazing group of panelists that are here to talk about how you can build a high performing um, team on the marketing side. So to introduce myself, um, my name is Raquel and I run our customer success department here at Promo Republic, but more importantly, I am the host of CMO Peer Talks. So if you're in our community, I'm sure you've seen me posting pretty actively on LinkedIn. Um, and if you're not, join us, scan this immediately. Um, CMO Peer Talks started off as these amazing podcast series where we invited great panelists in the franchise industry to share their knowledge. And it has really grown into an amazing community um, where we can share ideas and bounce off each other. So you can join right now. Again, scan this code. Um, I'll leave it on for maybe 20 seconds. Um, and then we can do the introductions for what you're here today. Again, to learn all about the um, how to build a high performing marketing team. So the first um, introduction or I'd like to make is Debo Paget. Can you hear us and welcome? Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, hi everybody, um, I'm Debo. I have been in the franchise space for almost eight years and I started um, with painting with a twist within the arts and crafts um, industry. And I've moved since over to Color Me Mine, which is a paint your own pottery franchise. Uh, we have 130 locations internationally um, and I oversee everything to do with marketing and creative. So, uh, you know, social media, brand strategy, national partnerships in all the way down to studio design. Amazing. Well, welcome. We're really excited to learn all about your experience. Our next panelist is uh, Kristen Pahachek. Welcome. How are you? I am good. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody. I'm Kristen. I work for Massage Lux, and we are a health and wellness brand offering massages and facials in a membership-based model. We have 73 units open and we'll open about 15 more this year. So we've got a lot of growth in the next five months we're really excited about. And in my role at Massage Lux, I've got two priorities as chief growth officer. I want to make sure that our franchisees are as successful, happy, and profitable as possible. I oversee the consumer demand generation. Then I have the unique ability to also kind of blend um, those tactics and strategies on the franchise development side of the business. And the second area of responsibility is really making sure that our franchise is growing from a unit perspective. So some big things ahead for the brand, and I'm excited to be along for the ride and to talk to you all today. Thank you. Um, congratulations on your growth. That's amazing. Adding 15 units at the end of this year. That's an amazing accomplishment. So congratulations for you and the entire Massage Lux team. Thank you. Our next uh, panelist is Julie Wade. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course. I have been with Tzatziki's about two years. The majority of my um, career has been in franchising, either for a large franchisor or um, a large franchisee or on the franchisor side. And here at Tzatziki's, I'm responsible for all of the marketing that we do. And we really kind of break that down into multiple different segments. So we have our, um, obviously our consumer marketing where we want to get customers into our stores and ordering uh, their meals from us. Then we also have marketing where we are uh, marketing to recruit employees and retain those employees. And then we also have the branch where we um, are marketing for new franchisees and helping the franchisees that we have grow. So I'm over all of that, um, have a great team here with me. And if you hear a little chaos out in the background, we just got finished with an all company meeting uh, right outside my door. So I think that they're probably chatting a little bit after getting to spend some time together, but thrilled to be here today and can't wait to um, have a good conversation. Excellent. Um, and don't worry, we can't hear any background noise thus far. So all good. <laughs> okay, good. And last but not least, we have Dawn White. How are you, Dawn? I'm good, thank you. Glad to be here. Um, yeah, so I am. Uh, I've been on the team at uh, Stride and Row House for just a few weeks. Um, moved over from Cycle Bar, joined Exponential Fitness, um, <clears throat> which is the the largest franchisor, 
of boutique fitness in the industry. Um, we've got 10 brands, more notable um, Cycle Bar, um, where I came from, um, Club Pilates, Pure Bar. So a lot of people know those brands. Um, and these are the two more emerging brands. Um, so that's sort of my wheelhouse. Um, been part of the founding teams of Massage Envy, the joint Amazing Lash Studio. So what I've really learned in 17 years of franchising is, you know, you've got to have a really great team. You have to have a, a great um, team around you. You have to hire people smarter than you. So I'm excited to share some of those insights and the things that I've learned and maybe shortcut somebody else along the way. Great. Thank you so much for joining. And that is exactly what we're here to do today to, you know, share past experiences, what works and doesn't work and learn from each other. So to open up, we have our first question, which is how can you best structure your in-house marketing team for a multi-location brand or franchise? Um, and we have, as you can see, a, quite a breadth of experience amongst our four panelists. Um, so I will open this up for you. Maybe, Julia, uh, you were just um, highlighting you have some all hands behind you. So just start off the excitement on that same energy. I would love to hear how you structure your in-house team. Well, great. Thank you. Um, well, we really strive to be an in-house marketing agency for our franchisees. Um, most of our franchisees do have some kind of local store marketing component. Um, we require that everyone have someone in the market that can service some of those functions, whether it's the, the social media part of it and responding to customer reviews and that type of thing. Um, Oh, we also combine our marketing along with catering sales. So that ends up being a combo uh, position a lot of times out in the field. Um, so in-house for us, we have um, all of those different functions um, represented inside our team so that we can service our franchisees um, and any needs that they have. And that goes all the way from creative to placement of digital ads. I mean, we don't do it necessarily in-house, but we have really good third-party partners that we work with um, that can sell anything all over the country. So um, somebody that is in Atlanta or um, Cincinnati or Dallas, they get the benefit of having um, that same service to be able to um, uh, place their, their ads there. Um, and we also have somebody that is dedicated to uh, numbers and really looking week to week, what is going on in those franchise um, locations. And he gives me every week a top five and a bottom five so that I can really go out and celebrate those top five, and whatever it is, every week it's a different metric. Um, and those that are in the bottom five of whatever it is that we can reach out and also um, give our support and any help that we may have from a corporate side um, and that's been real helpful to be able to, to cheer on those folks at the top, but then be encouragers and helpful to the ones that are at the bottom. Thank you so much for sharing. I like your anecdote about kind of acting as an agency. So being that arm that can really pr provide them with everything they need. I think that's a really unique way to put it. Um, Chris, and I did see you kind of nodding along to what Julie was saying. I'd love to hear how you're structuring everything internally in your organization. Yeah, of course. So I would start by saying it's not a one size fits all. If there was a perfect formula for how to structure a marketing team in a franchise organization, we would all be doing the same thing. Um, and so you have to cater a little bit to what you're trying to sell, whether you're a service or a product, the size of your franchise, et cetera. Um, the one piece of advice that I can give is to continually remember that as a marketer, you were servicing people who did not sign up for the business model to be marketers. And that's something that I have to like remind myself and my team continually is like, hey, they didn't get into this business to do a bunch of marketing. They got into this business to run a business. And while there's always going to be elements that we cannot do as a franchise or on behalf of our franchisees. There are going to be things as franchisees they're going to have to do in marketing. We got to take that heavy lifting and make it as plug and play as possible for the franchisees or the reality is it just won't get done. And we all experience that, right? I know we're all sitting around a table saying, why aren't our franchisees doing more marketing? Why aren't they joining the chamber? Why aren't they doing business connections, et cetera? Um, the reality is because they simply don't know how or they don't have time. They don't want to, right? They didn't do this business for that. 
Um, one of the things that I really like to do in my marketing teams is to hire what I refer to as unicorns, which <laughs> easier said than done. But in a merging brand, we don't have the luxury of having specialized departments in every area in which we need coverage and marketing. So we have to hire people who know a little bit about a lot of things and are really smart about bringing in partners where necessary to fill the gaps. And in a shoestring budget, which most of us have in the emerging space, you have to be very selective around when and how you bring in partners and when and how you bring in the staff in order to fill the needs that your business needs. We also, similar to Julie, operate a little bit like an internal agency in that we are doing a lot of the media placement on behalf of our franchisees, either internally or through some partnerships. We're doing a lot of that social media content as much as we possibly can for the franchisees. We're doing a lot of the playbooks and the scripting and the, of course, creative and branding that our franchisees need in order to be successful so that they don't have to. Absolutely. Um, Deval, what about for you? How is, um, what is your ethos to setting up a structured a marketing team? Well, I was going to say something. I agree with everything, of course, that's been said, but something um, that Julie said about sort of having those third party vendors um, and making sure that they're doing the most for you. Um, anytime that we sign on with a new vendor that's the marketing vendor, we make sure that, you know, our rep clicks with the team. Um, you know, that's essentially an extension of our in-house marketing team. Um, because like Kristen said, we have to create everything. They did not sign up to be marketers. They are small business owners who are still also learning how to be a small business owner. Um, so tacking on that local studio marketing, or that's what we call it, so sorry, local business marketing, um, that, you know, it's, it can be really overwhelming. And so those vendors really do heavy lifting for us in terms of digital media, social media, you know, um, all of the creative asset development, um, you know, we can sort of do it in-house, but then we lean on those vendors to help distribute it in a way that's palatable uh, to our franchisees and easy to use. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's a really interesting point in which every organization um, goes through, whether you're emerging or quite established, whether you're kind of weighing the balance of headcount internally versus going to a vendor partner. So seeing um, how you're structuring that and making sure that the vendor partner is an extension of your team is a really great point because you do want to vet who you're working with and do they match what you are trying to achieve as well. Don, you do have a unique perspective in this sense in that you've been at some uh, like large established organizations and you were brought in to an emerging brand to try and grow it to the same success that you have previously with your other brands. Can you share kind of the recipe for success that you've experienced thus far in terms of setting up a structured marketing team? Yeah, you know, um, I would agree with Kristen. There, there is no perfect way. It doesn't. It's not a one size fits all. Um, I think where I differ is I'm not always looking for the unicorns. I'm looking for people who um, are really just bought in, um, and I'm looking for people that are smarter than me. Um, I'm always looking for somebody who knows the space or understands exactly what it is they're going to contribute. Obviously, you have people who are newer that come onto the team that are going to grow. And you want to foster an environment where they can continue to grow and and kind of pattern out the things that you've built and you've maybe done in your own career that's gotten you to where you are. Um, but I feel like one of the places that I'm always looking is having teams that understand really what they're contributing and and knowing that we've hired the right person specifically for that. And to that extent, you know, again, would agree with everybody on here um, talking about, you know, hiring and having the right vendors in place place. They are an extension of, of our team. And it's fun for me to be on calls like this because I tell people that when I have consulted in the past, when I've built these brands um, and been part of these great teams that start out as nothing with no budget, right? Um, as Kristen said, you don't really, you're, you're on a shoestring, right? You don't always have um, a huge budget. So you really have to, you know, hire a little lean um, and get people who are, are bought in. Um, and for to that extent, really just having vendors at your table that understand what needs 
needs to be accomplished. Um, what I loved about this is I, I would tell people all the time, you have to get people who are an extension of your team. And it sounds unique to them, right? They're like, huh, that's interesting, right? They will work for me and they will be an extension and they will fill in, but everybody here gets it because they've all gone through it. Um, so you can hire a really great vendor, but if they have no skin in the game, if they don't understand what you're doing, um, it makes it a little bit more difficult as you get to be a bigger and bigger brand. You have to have vendors that will grow with you because starting to peel them away and pry them out of the hands of your franchisees who've gotten used to using them is inherently more difficult, right? Um, so those are the things that I've found have, have served me well is hire smart, um, know the positions that you need to fill for each brand. Not every brand is going to have the same needs. I wish even in the same building, I could tell you that I've moved from brand to brand to brand. This is now my third brand, my second and third brand at Expo, um, that, that it's a one size fits all. And it, it's not, it's not. It, each need is different for sure. Absolutely. Um, I think that's a really interesting point as well versus, um, you know, that right fit at the right time for the, like, um, an inch deep and a mile wide versus vice versa in the different stages of the organizations that you're all in. So we're, this question is really talking about structure and how to get that foundational team set. So I would love to hear, and anyone can jump in um, as you please, about what you think like the core, you know, that first, second hire, like what marketing specialist do you need immediately from the get-go besides yourself? I think it's it's a, what you're, oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, Kristen. No, that's okay. Um, I, I think it kind of depends on what your own personal strengths are. And then you need something that balances out that if you're very strong on social media and really feel like, okay, I've got this, um, then maybe you need to bring in somebody that's a little more um, strategic or um, has more of the, the big picture view and vice versa. Um, you know, being in this role, I inherited a few folks a couple of years ago when I started and it, we were kind of coming out of the phase where everybody worked on everything because it was a very small team. Everybody had to have a part in it. And now we're much more um, siloed. So I, I guess, you know, starting off, you do need some of those people who can balance you out and then also, um, you know, know a little bit about a lot of different things, have maybe some good writing skills and can help out a little bit in PR world um, and writing some of your content. Yeah, there, there's a lot of different, um, you know, uh, areas out there. You just have to find the one that balances you and is the biggest need for your group at that particular time. I was going to say the same thing, wherever your weakness lies, hire for that. If you're a data marketer, hire a creative marketer. If you are a visionary marketer, hire a strategic marketer, um, match with somebody who can help you bring things to life that you wouldn't be able to bring to life on your own. Absolutely. Um, I, I definitely agree with that. So just kind of the last question, summing up the, the personnel aspect of a marketing team is what would be your go-to sources for finding the top talent in the franchise space? Don, would you like to highlight? Cause I know you've had such um, great experience as well. I've spent the last year trying to hire for every position imaginable on my teams. Um, it has been horrible. Um, you know, truthfully, LinkedIn is a great resource. We all have great connections. I think when you get to um, the, the top of the org chart in, uh, in franchising or in your field, reaching out to people that you know and that you've met along the way and people that maybe you knew, you know, somebody that was very early stages five years ago, 10 years ago, they might be exactly that that person that you need right now. Um, so reaching out to your network's great. I've tried um, a variety of different online sites. Definitely, I can tell you when you're going higher up um, on the food on the food chart, um, definitely looking to get in the right um, recruiter is important. And that, again, depends. If you're looking director level or above VP, your CMOs, that really should go through and it's a worthwhile investment because you really need somebody who's going to drive strategy and going to drive the numbers for your business. Um, and that, that's sometimes difficult to find, right, in your network. I wouldn't say that you can't always find that. Um, 
But one of the other things that I always recommend is to start building a network early, um, especially as, you know, whether it's men or women, but again, women in franchising, since we're all on the panel, um, coincidentally or not, right? It's reaching out and building your own network too, so that I'm going to get job opportunities that any number of women on this call could be qualified for. And when a recruiter calls me and it's not the right fit for me for whatever reason, geography or um, structure or the industry, knowing somebody that you've sat on a panel with, knowing somebody that you've met at business meetings that has a good reputation that's tied into your network is also another really great way, right, to introduce. So knowing the right recruiters for your industry, super important, that also is really important. Important. A lot of people will call and say, you know, I've got something for you in the restaurant space. And that's awesome, but I have no restaurant experience. So don't call me for that, right? Um, it doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't translate, but it might not be of interest. So I think always knowing somebody um, in those spaces um, is really just the, the best way to get good quality people. Um, the rest of it's a crapshoot. Doesn't mean you're not going to get great people. Um, but I do feel like it's a little bit like online dating. You're doing a lot of swiping before you find that person. Uh, so yeah, I, that, that would be my, my best suggestion would be um, tapping into a network, building a network, being connected, keeping your eye on who's in the industry and who the key players are. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Um, we have had um, a few questions come through regarding the hiring aspect. So I'll just ask um, one of them and we can save the rest for after the period, but I think this one's really um, interesting given we highlighted um, Kristen having her unicorn aspect and Dawn preferring um, like the specialized niche. Um, so we do have a question from the field about um, when you're hiring someone that needs to know a little bit about everything, do you look for a specific resume format or how do you not overwhelm marketing specialists? So Kristen, maybe since this is more unicorn focused, could you highlight how you yeah. hire? I mean, I, you know, the resume format, I, I don't really have a preference in regard to how you structure your resume. What I look for is I love people with franchising experience because that is a huge hur hurdle to teach. But when you are hiring for an entry level position, that can be really difficult to find um, because most people don't have franchising experience until they get into a franchise and have a job. Um, but what I look for are people who I love agency folks, love them for entry level positions or um, even middle management positions. The reality of franchising is that we somewhat act like an agency or a consultant. So people who have consulted on the side or maybe started their own little marketing thing while they were in college. I love that because I know that they're going to bring some customer service experience. They're also going to bring a little bit of a sales experience and whether we want to believe it or not, even if we're not officially on the sales side of the business, we're selling to our franchisees every day. We're selling our ideas, our beliefs, our um, playbooks. And so I like that those people come in with some experience as to how to talk to franchisees. And typically those people, they work really hard. You're coming from an agency or you're coming from running your own practice. You know how to put in the work. And so I know that you're going to be able to flex and push in multiple areas. I don't worry so much about the unicorn in the sense of, oh, they've got SEO, they've got creative, they've got data analysis, et cetera. I worry about or look at people who are unicorns from a standpoint that they can flex into multiple areas by self-teaching and by coaching. Thank you for sharing. That's great feedback. Um, so as mentioned, any questions our audience does have, please feel free to throw it into the question and answer box. We can bring in the questions like this if they're relevant, or we can answer everything at the end. So definitely keep them coming. And then as you can see, some of our panelists are answering them on the go, which is amazing. So you'll always get um, your questions answered. So shifting to point number two, we highlighted this from quite a few of our panelists today about vendors. How are you managing that? Like, what does the relationship look like? At what point are you bringing them in? So we can, um, I think it would be great to peel back the, the onion, so to speak, on what are the golden rules from managing vendor relationships? I think, Deboe, you had a really interesting one about I need to make sure they gel with our team. So maybe do you want to highlight, um, you can kick off the questions, just kind of building from there. Sure. So we, we do a lot of team building with our vendors. 
Um, we communicate with them regularly. Uh, you know, the golden rule really is just to have open, respectable communication. Um, you know, and and part of that transparency is whether or not you know, that vendor is still making sense for you to use, you know, and constantly keeping the open mind that you might be adapting. Uh, like Kristen said, it is inherently awful to, or maybe Dawn said this, so sorry, to switch vendors um, in terms of the franchise, you know, sort of education piece with that. Um, you know, it seems that a lot of times once you get the system really accustomed and, you know, you have those adoption rates up um, and then you go and sort of pull that rug from under them and switch vendors, then um, that could sometimes do more damage than good. But it's important, especially with the way that technology is evolving. Um, and especially with the way that the new workforce is coming up, you know, Gen Z is entering into those um, entry level positions and they are, they function completely different. They are unicorns, but not in the millennial sense, um, in a whole different way that we can't even fathom um, because they've, they've been using you know, technology and their brains just work different. And so a lot of those vendor relationships, account reps and everything will be within that millennial generation space. I mean, Gen Z generation space. Um, and so it's, it's a lot about honesty and authenticity in terms of making sure that those relationships Stay good. Um, I actually was reading a statistic about, or maybe it was like an argument that we were having about the different generational divides. And I'm pretty sure all of us are millennials on the call today where we can, we were the last generation to have a childhood without technology, like point blank. So I think that's really unique because we look back with nostalgia. But as you said, like the people that grew up with literally screens and phones and tablets in their hands, they have such a different set of skills than what we have and can adapt so much quicker because that's all they know. Um, so that's a really interesting point. Um, Julie, I would love to hear what your golden rules are for managing these vendor relationships. Yeah, going back to something Debo said about um, changing them, um, you know, in the two years that I've been at Tzatziki's, we've really changed almost every major marketing vendor that we have. Um, and some of them have been more painful than others. Um, and really the, the best way to kind of facilitate that and kind of my golden rule is that we always need to be an advocate for our vendors with our franchise community. So um, we, we can't you know, the vendors are the ones that we chose uh, for the most part. So we need to be their advocate if something goes wrong. Um, if a franchisee is not happy with something, uh, we need to be the go between and kind of fall on that proverbial sword uh, for them. Thankfully, I really haven't had that many experiences in that type of situation. Um, and in changing the vendors, um, it's been a really pretty smooth process in some of the ways. Um, we've had some franchisees were extremely hesitant. Um, for example, we changed public relations vendors and the person who was doing our PR, um, when I first got here, she had gotten to know a lot of the franchisees very well. She had always attended our conferences, had formed those personal relationships, and they I would actually go straight to her for things instead of coming through the corporate office. Um, so when it was announced that we were switching vendors, there was a lot of immediate kind of, oh no, how are we going to survive? Um, and I think what we've done since we changed, um, you know, first of all, when we did make the change, we laid out a very simple process and, and you know, told everybody very transparently, this is why we're doing it, this is who we're going with, and this is why. Um, and then we've celebrated those successes with the new vendor all along the way. So that all of the franchisee system is very aware of the new things that we're doing in Charlotte, North Carolina, and the things that are happening in Dallas and the things that are happening in, happening in Louisville, Kentucky. So they can see and feel comfortable with our new vendor because um, there are so many things that we've been able to champion and to really celebrate over the past few months that we've had that new vendor. So that's um, definitely how I deal with that and um, really do just, uh, I think like Debo said, treat them like an extension of our team as well. So we have regular phone calls, um, you know, weekly and then bi-monthly with our other major vendors. 
and really include them on everything that we're doing. So they do feel very included and very much part of our team, just an extension of it. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Um, Don, I'd love to hear what your golden rules are, um, both at established organizations or emerging organizations. Yeah, you know, they're they're the same for me. Um, it's it's again, we're we're all focused on that extension of your team. But in order to do that, they again I, I would agree with Julie that you have to have full transparency. They need to know what it is you're doing. Um, we do um, marketing symposiums on once a year with our marketing fund committee, where we'll introduce the vendors um, to them and also share with the vendors what it is that we have on the horizon for the coming year. What are my objectives? What do we need to accomplish um, at the local store level? Um, and how are they going to do that, right? Again, if they're an extension of your team, they have to work like they're part of your team. And so if the franchisees are requiring you know, their assistance with digital or, um, you know, some automations or whatever that might be, having them understand what it is we're trying to achieve in the coming year is vital. So I share with them my marketing calendar, what the strategy is. Um, so they understand where the franchisees are, right? They're going to be franchisee facing. Um, so I do set some, um, you know, baseline understanding of what communication looks like. I'm pretty transparent um, with all of my franchisees and vendors where, I let the vendors know if your performance isn't where it needs to be and a franchise asks me to leave you to go to another digital vendor, I don't want them bouncing from one to the other. And they're not always going to get better results. But if you don't have that relationship, if you haven't earned that franchisee's trust, they're not going to spend money with you. And that is going to prevent them from making their goals and me making mine. So I want there to be that shared team win, but I also want there to be honesty and, and open communication. Um, at Exponential, we all have have a shared number as a portfolio company of vendors that we utilize. Each brand is fortunate to have autonomy in picking and each marketing department can choose who they're going to utilize, which is great. Um, however, there's all these shared learnings, right? And so what might be a great fit for one brand and one franchisee who's come from one system into another just might not be a great fit for this brand right? Um, and so again, transparency, having them understand why, right, they're a good fit for and in, incorporating them. When I came here, and we had like, I think we had almost 10 vendors for digital available to 10. At the time, there were eight brands when I came during pandemic. Um, and we, you know, we sifted through, is this person a good fit for? Is this brand a good fit for? Can they scale? Some of the bigger ones are really, really great for bigger systems because they have more people, but maybe they're not that same level of customer service. Um, some of the brands were spending a lot more. So, and didn't maybe have that same time and attention or they were bigger and they had more time and attention because they have more people on their team to interface with that vendor. So what we did was unify um, and just level that playing field. I required all of my digital vendors to be on one call together instead of those weekly calls I would have or bi-weekly calls. I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. I can read the numbers. I don't need you explaining them to me, right? Um, so I think the more important thing was what best practices do they have to share? So they have to have skin in the game. They have to have skin in the game. They have to be willing to do things that other vendors aren't always going to be. They have to step up when we need them to. They have to be responsive to the franchisee's needs. They have to treat these businesses as if they are their own. And they have to be open and honest in their communication because we don't really have time to kind of figure out, right, the, the conversation rather than like, here's the problem. We can or cannot fix it. We need help here. The franchisee is being unreasonable or they're being reasonable. I'm the best salesperson for my vendors. I'm either going to require a vendor be utilized in some cases or heavily right, recommend. And so if that's the case and I'm putting my neck on the line, they've got to do the same, right? They've got to be willing to do the same for my franchise owners. So that's really my golden rule is kind of do unto others, right? You want to treat our franchisees really well because there's not a lot of selling in it. Once a network has a larger number of their franchisees with a vendor, it's about caretaking that relationship. So that's really where my focus is primarily. It's relationship driven, um, consistency in some of those results. You don't always get that with digital vendors, especially. You're not going to get consistency all the time. Um, but I think that buying into that relationship um, and, and making sure that it's mutually beneficial is absolutely my minimum requirement. 
Absolutely. I think that was really, really well said. And I leads us to kind of a sub question of this question that I will open up to everyone. Um, but you've all touched upon it a little bit. Um, but maybe Kristen, you can start us off on what is the best way to control and oversee the performance of your outsource teams? You know, you've all highlighted that maybe you've switched from them because it wasn't working well, or maybe you need to meet with them weekly or biweekly, or, or you need to just measure that performance. So how do you kind of control that? So the ball is in your court and the driver. Yeah, so I think the first thing, and, and everyone's really hit on it, but you got to treat your partners, and I use partner because vendor just, uh, uh, um, I don't know, <laughs> partners, like they're employees of yours, which means you need to build trust with them and you need to build a personal relationship so that when the performance that you talked about isn't going well, the conversation can be candid, but one in which they're still trusting and um you know, has a coaching element to it. And so the first thing that I want to do is make sure that once a partner is brought on, which is kind of a lengthy process for me, just because I want to make sure that we do build that trust and that we do have an understanding that we can have really tough conversations that don't result in, um, you know, a breakup in the relationship. It's just kind of business at that point, but we're still friends and um, Mm -hmm. we can still talk through the good things that are happening as well. I like things in a central place. So when we're doing data, we're typically working um, to roll out like Tableau right now so that we can pull everything together um, so that we aren't going to a million spreadsheets and we are being very clear about what we are looking at and can start to trend that data. The other thing that was sort of brought up um, by Don is I think that it's important to have partners talk to each other, especially as you grow. When you grow, you're going to have potentially a PR agency, a digital marketing agency. You might have a creative agency and you have all of these people doing different things. But the reality is if you're about ready to launch a digital marketing campaign centered on X, Y, or Z, and your PR company isn't hearing the elements of that campaign you may be missing an opportunity to tie things together. So it's really important to make sure that you're pulling your partners together. I love the idea of a partner summit where every year, um, to Don's point about not having a ton of time, you're like, hey, here's the strategic direction for the business. Here's how the marketing team is going to support that business. Here are our growth goals and our big campaigns and our big milestones for the year. Let's chat about how to come together to make this all happen. I think that's really, uh, really interesting. And I, um, how the vendor summit's really intriguing to me. And um, has anyone on the panel done one before? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and massage Lux, you know, I mean, it's, uh, we're small enough here where, you know, we can kind of translate for and work together to make sure everything's synchronized. But, um, you know, prior to massage Lux, I spent five years with a brand with 5,000 locations and with 5,000 locations, you need a lot of partners and it is impossible to start to translate between those partners. And many times different leaders are leading um, each of those partner relationships. So you'll have a, you know, a digital VP and a creative VP and a, you know, so on and so forth. And those people are having to talk to each other who are then having to translate to partners. And it is a lot of red tape that can be cut by just pulling everybody together in a room and starting to talk about how to bring things to life. The closest that we've done to that has been more of an informal session when we've had our um, big conferences, which we just had one this past May for the first time since 2019, of course. Um, But that's really a time that everybody does get to come together and those vendors get to talk and know each other and, um, you know, get to hear about what we're doing from a a corporate strategic standpoint. But I I love the idea of doing a a summit at the beginning of the year to kind of set the table for the rest of the year. So I think I'm going to incorporate that into our plans um, coming up this fourth quarter. I mean, that's exactly why, you know, we're here to take ideas and see what works and what doesn't. So that's really interesting and really helpful. Um, so moving on to our last and final question, um, I did want to open it up about creating synergy between your marketing team and franchisees. I also saw a question come through about, you know, how are you managing being the coach, mentor, friend, family, et cetera, to your franchisees? And we know you're playing a lot of roles. 
Um, and as Kristen has said, you're also selling to them because you're selling the value of what you're doing as a marketing team. So this is quite the balancing act that you have to do when you're supporting the franchisees. So um, I would love to open it up. Maybe Zabao, you could kick us off and we can kind of jump around from there. Sure. So we rely very heavily on our FAC, so our Franchise Advisory Council. Um, you know, we make sure that we're taking um, ideas from them and they each have a region. They were, they were voted in by their peers within the system. Um, and so they already hold some influence and trust over those peers. Um, mm -hmm. And so part of that is including them on all of of our decision making, essentially, you know, um, when it comes down to it, we do have the last word, but, um, you know, we make sure that they're involved in all the strategic processes, especially with vendor selection, um, you know, and that the national marketing calendar, everything, we have meetings monthly with our FAC, um, just to make sure that we are in the, going the right track. Um, and then they become advocates for us and they help sort of get everyone excited. Um, there's a lot of enthusiasm. I luckily work for a, a brand that's all about fun and art. Um, and so everything is really kind of exciting and enthusiastic on its own. Um, but I really, I rely on those, on those FAC members and then also just franchisees that I've become close with as well um, to help kind of, you know, influence other other franchisees to either adopt a platform or start a new promotion of something, you know, things like that. Um, I, I've seen a huge increase in adoption with a lot of different platforms, national promotions, things like that um, over the past two years uh, than, than we saw before. Absolutely. Um, Donna, could you share how you're creating synergy between corporate marketing team and franchisees? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I would I would agree with Debo that you know that utilizing and leveraging that relationship that you have with um, you know the FAC or your MFC in order to tap into the things that they are focused on um, to be able to get buy in is is vital. Um, what I would say though is that um, probably the the biggest focus that I have with my teams um, in creating synergy, you yeah, have come into places where I've had to do turnarounds and there was a lot of discord. Um, I've been in some places where franchisees were no longer bought in or really just sort of throwing their hands in the air or selling their locations. We just came out of a pandemic, right? And I just came in and was just like, hi, you know, I know everybody went out and bought a Peloton, you know, your cycle bar is going to be fine. Yeah, how do you build that credibility? And a lot of that is, you know, that synergy um, between the team and the franchisees has to be focused on a shared plan. You have to be clear about what the shared focus is. We are in this together, right? Um, and I think that synergy really comes from making sure they understand what your objectives are and that you're aligned with what the franchisee needs from your team, right? How do they get to those goals? What are the goals? Are they shared goals? How are we gonna get there? So being sure that you have a plan. I've been part of teams. Look, my greatest success at Massage Envy, we threw a lot of stuff up against the wall. I didn't know anything. I was um, I, I was a millennial then. It was a long time ago, but I appreciate you thinking that I'm part of that. So I'm going to feel good all day. Um, but I, I think that um, back then, you know, I think that the focus was, um, you know, just try to kind of get through it. Here's the plan, work the plan because the plan works and franchisors always have that mindset. I always have that mindset. If I see somebody that's straying too far from the path, it's get back on the path. This is what you bought. Franchising is a recipe, a little bit more salt, a little bit more pepper, you know, you're okay, or a little salt and a little sugar, right? You can you can do a little pinch of, of one or a little more of another, but when you replace one with the other, you get a totally different recipe. Um, and so building that synergy really comes from making sure they understand what that shared goal is. And also, if you can structure your team, you know, if you have performance marketers, then focusing them on the shared goal around AUV. So if you're trying to build a successful financial model and stronger system wide sales, then your team needs to be bought in, not just on driving lead gen or demand gen, um, or even brand awareness, but driving revenue through those doors. And so if there is a way to incentivize your team on average unit volume, that gets everybody really on that same page. Um, and, and again, bought into shared goals. Yeah, to piggyback on what Don was saying, um, you know, about making sure that everybody understands the goals and is bought in, 
we do um, two different quarterly webinars. One is more operationally focused and we'll, we'll talk a little bit of marketing in it, but we'll probably only have two or three slides kind of going over the big um, emphasis for the next quarter. And then um, we do specifically for the marketing community um, and we have about a hundred units right now. So, um, you know, there, there's a pretty good group of marketing folks. We do a separate webinar just with them once a quarter that really goes in depth on all of the goals, what we're trying to achieve. And so that way they know how to plan their local marketing based around what we're doing and making sure that they're not doing anything that's going to conflict or compete with the messaging that we're putting out from a corporate standpoint. I think the other really important thing is honesty and transparency. Like, listen, at the end of the day, like I said to start, there's no perfect rule book or perfect recipe for success with this stuff. And I think it's okay that the franchisees know that. Um, often you have franchisees who are on different sides of the spectrum, believing different things. One wants to go low price. One wants to go high price. One wants this, the other wants that. And it's okay to say, Hey guys, you got somebody over here wanting this. You got somebody over here wanting this. We're stuck in the middle trying to stay scalable and consistent as a franchise. And we're backed against the wall. What would you do in our scenarios? And most of the time you're going to get a, a, and they start to realize really quickly that we are in a role in which we are trying to make the best decision for the brand and the bulk of the franchisees. And that's really important. And there are two kind of things. I wish I could coin these. I did not come up with these. I learned them, heard them at some conference somewhere. Someone really smart said these two things. And I try to keep them in my head at all times. Number one, when a franchisee is successful, it's because of the franchisee. When the franchisee is not successful, it's corporate's fault. It's the franchisor's fault. Number two, just about the time you get sick of saying it, the franchisee is hearing it for the first time, which means repeat, repeat, repeat <laughs> until you're blue in the face. And eventually you will gain some ground, not all the ground, but little by little, you will gain some ground, some trust um, and some progress. And so stick with it. Franchising can be kind of a thankless job at times, but then when you do get those things, they make up for the a hundred times that you didn't. I couldn't agree more. It's everything, those two things. Um, you know, repeat, repeat, repeat. So, you know, we do monthly webinars with our system. We have a weekly, um, you know, newsletter that goes out. We have a Facebook group that's private that we post every update, you know, and all the links. And, you know, we, we do still get questions at the end of every month of, hey, where is this? Or have you released this yet? You know, and it's, and, you know, hundreds of touches up until that point, but it's, they're seeing it for the first time. So it is, you have to consistently repeat. Um, and it's because they're busy. It goes back to the whole thing of their small business owners, not marketers. Um, you know, they're not thinking about the social media holidays at the end of the quarter, you know, like I'm thinking about them, um, you know, and things like that. So I completely agree. I will be taking those with me, Kristen. I love that. Thank you. All right. So um, our panel has been really great and insightful and everyone shared different ways either achieving their goals and every organization is a different industry. We have fitness, food, um, and so on. And we are so thankful to have learned from you all today. Um, just a little bit of context of Promo Republic. We're a local marketing platform that helps manage social media brand integrity and findability online. Um, for multi-location brands specifically, we work with amazing franchise partners of our own. And um, so that's a little bit about us, which you can always contact us for. Um, but more importantly, our panelists. So if you have any questions that maybe you weren't um, answered today, you can always scan right here. All of our panelists, as um, Don said, the franchising industry is a small tight-knit family. So we're all here to help one another. With the remaining uh, five to 10 minutes that we do have left, I will open it up to questions because we did get some really valuable ones come through. Um, and if you're still on with us, feel free to ask because now we're doing the live Q&A. Um, so I think we can start with one that ties into what we were discussing earlier about um, 
hiring and finding that right fit to join your team? Um, this was answered in some context, but I do want to kind of maybe take a poll on, um, do you believe having prior franchise experience um, is necessary in today's market? Um, so maybe Julie, I see an inquisitive face if you want to want to share. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what level person that you're talking about. Um, if it's mid-level or below, probably not. Um, I think that in today's hiring climate, you're putting yourself too much in a box if you're requiring that. Um, but it certainly is helpful for someone that has um, any kind of franchising background for some of those upper level positions for certain. Um, I actually had somebody on my team uh, that I hired in a digital marketing role and she didn't have direct franchise experience, but she had worked for a, a large travel um, group and they had independent consultants. And so she was doing a lot of the same type of things. So it wasn't direct franchise experience, but she still could take enough of that type of knowledge and transfer it into our uh, system. So, you know, I, I think you're probably need to expand your horizons. Um, franchising is a big hurdle, but it can be taught. Um, so I, I would look even outside of the franchising community. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else have thoughts on whether you think the franchise experience is needed or maybe um, different? Yeah. I agree. Uh, Sorry, go ahead, Don. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I agree with Julie in that, you know, um, I would say upper management director roles, it, it would be a huge plus for franchising experience um, just because there's such a different workflow. Um, but entry level now, you know, you'll miss out on tons of people um, that would be great at franchising, you know, if that was a requirement, I think. So I was just echoing Julie, totally agree. Uh, Don? Um, yeah, no, I, I would agree the same um, to echo both of those sentiments that it depends on the level. Um, I think that there are a couple of other factors to consider too. Number one, how good are you at training that? right? If you're really good at franchising, you can even get a director or a VP level to do that job and to wear that many, those many hats, right? I saw the question come in about mentor and coach and, right? And, um, you know, if you're putting out good results and, and you are credible um, and you are hiring people who are bought in and want to do the right work for franchise owners and have the ability to do that in their areas of, of responsibility, then I think that that can be taught. It's relationship building. I mean, look, there are a lot of moving pieces around making things scalable, but again, it depends on the level of the individual that you're bringing in um, and, and that level of emotional intelligence, that level of understanding that somebody has invested their children's college education into a business that they're hoping will flourish or they're building something that they believe is a legacy so that they can cut the chains from a corporate lifestyle, right? A corporate work environment and be their own boss. If you're not sensitive to that, it doesn't matter who you hire. And the other thing is that if you're looking for somebody with franchise experience, I would caution you to look at somebody with relative or successful franchise experience. We all too often are like, this person was in a franchise. Well, that's great. You could be part of a really large franchise system and never have had to consult that level. So it's great if you're like, hey, this person was at McDonald's, they're brilliant, they have that name. I can't tell you how many people call me and they're like, Massage Envy, and it was big. Hey, it was 33 locations, right, when we started. And just because I've grown doesn't mean that I'm not just as tactical as I am strategic. I've worn every hat in that department and that makes me more valuable here because I didn't come up siloed, right, into a single place. So knowing what it is, again, going back to that core rule of what are you looking for? What hole do you need to fill in your team? And is franchising experience entirely necessary for that? Or is it relevant experience? Um, and I think that going all the way back to the beginning, um, I thought Kristen made such a great point about that, you know, the, the resume structure or the format, not necessarily important. I like to see those things bubble up that show that you have a diverse background, regardless of what level you're coming in at. And so as she pointed out, having somebody with agency experience, right, could translate really, really well 
for any level of, because they're working with clients, because they're bought into the success of the client, because they want to win that account. Again, it really just depends on on where you are, what your specific needs are. Um, I feel like at this point, I can teach anybody franchising. I can't teach everybody to be a great marketer. That's really well said. Um, Thank you all for sharing your feedback. Um, I think the last question will be kind of a quick one, maybe in my head to close out because I feel like everyone might have the same answer. Um, But this is a good question. The question is, how long did it take until you feel like you figured it out? (laughs) Yeah, that's exactly what I thought it would be. (laughs) Oh, God, I don't know that it'll ever be truly figured out, right? Um, I think that we get better every single day. And I think that that's part of the thrill of the chase, right? We always want our franchisees to make more money. We always want the franchise to grow. We always want the people who are working at the franchise or level to grow and to exceed. And um, I think, you know, we've said it, there's no perfect... um, there's no perfect bullet to this, right? It's like, there's no magic bullet. It's, um, you know, you keep trying every single day as it relates to that. And I'm looking at the question, like in in relation to processes and vendors, um, you know, I think I'm a big fan of building the skateboard while building the car, right? And so that there's like, you do a little bit, maybe you add a wheel and then you you add another wheel and another wheel. and, And then eventually you've turned a skateboard into a car, but then you may want a truck. So you just keep going and going and going until, um, you know, you have to build a second car. I agree. Uh, I mean, I I don't have it figured out. I have found that the more I learn, the less I know, Um, you know, and especially back to what Dawn said about having that emotional intelligence, you know, every franchisee has so many layers and so many things that motivate them and, and how they want to run their business that, you know, it just adds that extra layer to whatever the strategy is and how they're going to execute it. Um, so hopefully one day, you know, we'll have it figured out. <laughs> so I, I, at first, when you asked the question, I was like, shoot, we're supposed to have it all figured out. We're in trouble. Um, <laughs> we're all, we're all going to crash and burn. Um, so I would say I've done this for a long time. Um, I'm at that age. I just turned 50 um, last week, humbling. Um, And I can tell you that I do feel like I have this pretty well figured out and I know what I'm going to know. There's always a day where I come in and I learn something new about marketing's an ever-changing landscape, right? Um, But I feel like I got this job. I figured this out. I know how to do this. And the number one thing that I figured out was I don't have all the answers. My job is to have all the questions. My job is to remove the obstacles from my team. My job is to come and ask all the questions. You're never going to have all the answers for every scenario because there is so much diversity in franchising, in ownership, in business owner needs, in different scenarios, right? I've got owners that have taken over businesses for their kids that they've invested in. Um, And I've got people that are, you know, going through a divorce and they had a partnership and they're splitting up their assets and their assets are the business that you're trying to build, right? Your franchise ownership. So, you know, you just never know what the day is going to bring and the marketing landscape that changes, right? One minute you're pushing everything out on reels. The next minute your videos get shoved into reels, right? Like who even knows, right? Um, Algorithms change. My job is to ask the questions. I know at this point in my career, all the different stones to turn over. And I feel like that's really our jobs, right? What stone do you look under? What do you turn over? Where do you find the answers if you don't have them? Really well said. Thank you all. Uh, We're right at time, which is great. And I have pulled up on the screen everyone's um, QR codes once again, because I know this has been such a, an inspiring conversation and really helpful for everyone on today's panel, as well as our um, amazing attendees who have been really um, asking great questions. So with that, thank you all for joining today. It was really great to um, speak with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Thanks so much for having us. Of course, of course. Have a great day, everyone. And we'll see you on the next one.